Mic check. There we go. Good afternoon, everyone. You are in the science track. This panel is regeneration. If you're not here, then you need to be somewhere else. All right. Uh, before we get started, um, uh, please remember, please have your mask on the whole time we're in here. Try not to eat anything. Sips of water is fine. We're trying to prevent spread of things, you know. Um, the next thing um, that I want to mention is the charity uh, we are raising for Open Hands. They're an organization for um, giving um, good nutrient-rich foods to those in need. Um, so every dollar for dollar, Jackon will match up to, I think, $10,000 or $100,000. I don't remember which one, but please help us make them pay. Um, outside of that, um, take it away. All right. So this is the regeneration panel. I thought that we would start with some introductions. Um, my name is Marissa. I'm the moderator. My background's in neuroscience, so not uh, not this. So I'll take it to our panelists to introduce themselves. I'm Topher Hunter. Uh, I did my PhD in bioengineering at, over at Georgia Tech, um, which and basically spe sp specializing in tissue engineering, which is a component of regenerative medicine. Uh, I'm Jen Hardy. Um, I have my PhD in molecular biology from Yale, and I worked more on the genetic side of things and like the developmental biology, how you get these things in the first place. And I'm Paul Curry, and my doctorate is in veterinary medicine, so I look at the medical applications of regeneration. Can y'all hear him? How's that mic? It's a uh, five. It's number five. Turn it up to 11. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. There oh, there we go. Yay! All right. So, I have um, such a quiet voice. You need the mic. <laughs> um, so I thought that we could get started by talking about a couple of real life examples um, that I know that that all of you have, you know, done some research on. Um, so ways that we've seen regenerative properties uh, work really well in, in the wild, so to speak. Okay. Um, so one uh, nice example is uh, liverectomies. When you're, especially if you're donating your uh, portion of your liver to another patient who, say, has bad cirrhosis or hepatitis, uh, you can donate up to two-thirds of your liver and completely regenerate the remaining uh, mass. And actually, the regeneration occurs over the space of about a week. Livers are cool. Um, the, the other like, really notable example in vertebrates is salamanders. So there's, uh, especially the salamanders from Mexico called axolotls. You cut off their arms, and they can regenerate the whole arm over the course of a few weeks. I actually used to work right next door to a lab that worked on that stuff. So they had all these adorable, like, gimpy axolotls <laughs> in a tank with, like, three legs swimming in circles oh my while they researched, like, exactly what the pathways were that let them regrow their, their legs. And I get the easy one. I get starfish, which, you know, all you need is a piece of a starfish and you can grow a new one. And theirs is actually really specialized because they're one of the few that truly can regenerate uh, neurons and their nerve uh, potential. Did it die again? Gonna try the other mic? Yeah. Right. One of these mics. Oh, right. There you go. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So starfish are really cool because, in addition to being able to regenerate their whole body, they're one of the few that can actually regenerate nervous system and are true perfected regeneration, which a lot of the others aren't exactly perfect. Like you hear about lizard tails, but the lizard tails don't always uh, ossify, so they stay cartilaginous instead of full bone, so. I remember hearing when the, uh, the crown of thorns starfish is this really invasive uh, on the Great Barrier Reef, and somebody got the bright idea of going and catching them all and then chopping them up and tossing them back in. Yeah, that's a really bad idea with starfish. Now oh you turn one God. starfish into five starfish. Uh, are there examples of of this? I mean, I guess this is sort of <laughs> to that point where it doesn't quite work so well. Where, um, yeah, c are there other examples of that sort of invasive property? So one of the interesting ones in humans is actually when you're young, you can actually regenerate the tips of your fingers and toes. 
Um, so the way human bodies are chunked up is we're in thirds. You've got a head, a torso, and legs. You've got the top of your arm, the bottom of your arm, your hand. You've got one, two, three on your digits. And as long as you're out on the farthest one of the third, you can regenerate it through about the age of like seven or eight. So like little kids can grow back fingertips and toe tips, but we lose the ability when we get older. What, uh, if I may ask, what, what's the mechanism behind that? Why, what happens to make us lose the ability? I think part of it's actually your immune system. Um, that's one of the problems in mammals is that our immune systems are a little too good. Uh, salamanders actually have pretty wussy immune systems. And so that's one thing we're realizing if we want this to work in people is you probably have to make people at least a little immunocompromised, at least in the area where you're trying to regrow things, uh, which could be a little dicey. Yeah, intended. I mean that. That's <clears throat> um, you know that that plays into one of the big things is that this is always a balance of how aggressively is the tissue regenerating, rebuilding, versus how how aggressively is it how is it mis inappropriately growing, right? That's cancer. You get excessive growth uh, in an inappropriate area. You get. I mean, how many times have you read something about, you know, take this, this berry or this juice or whatever, and it'll boost your immune system? Well, guess what a boosted immune system is? It's an autoimmune disease. That's where your immune system is tearing your own body apart. Or cytokine storms. Everybody remember that from COVID? So you can go too far, and it's really easy to trip over that line. And then we can really muddy the waters on this and talk about... Regeneration, a lot of people think about cellular regeneration, and it's the cells dividing, making more of themselves, or uh, going back to stem form and uh, redifferentiating. But some cells, neurons in particular, can regrow pieces of themselves. They don't divide. They can just regrow their axons, dendrites. The communication kind of going on the amoeba side, the pseudopod form, the extensions off of the cells. Is it regeneration? It's debatable. The cells aren't actually dividing. But at the same instance, it can replace a damaged version. Like this is a tough thing in like in humans. One of the issues is that some of our cells when they become mature change pretty radically. Like muscle cells start merging and you end up with these big cells that have a ton of different nuclei. They can't divide anymore. Um, because they've altered themselves. Neurons can't divide anymore. Uh, so if you lose those things, it's, you can't make more of them. You have to go back to a stem cell if you want to regenerate neurons or muscle cells or things like that. And that's a cool trick that salamanders are able to pull. They're actually able to pull some of those cells back um, out of like terminal versions back to a more stem-like state so that they can regenerate a nerve, they can regenerate a muscle cell. It's pretty cool. So nerve cells are really neat in that, um, and just to, to give you a picture of it, right? Typical, a typical nerve cell has the body and it has what's called the axon. So the body is, call it my body, and then the axon is my arm and it reaches out. And a signal will initiate in my body and then it travels down the arm and then, really? <laughs> <laughs> it travels down the arm and goes, <laughs> and then fires and it passes off, right? Nice. So my neuron, my, my axon passes the message and it goes across something called a synapse and then it goes on and it passes down. So, and as, as you just said, you can, you can sometimes sever the axon of a nerve cell and the, the, the cell body will send out a new axon. One of the really interesting discoveries in the last 20-ish years was that as, especially as the first nerve cells lay down that path to go from say my brain to the tip of my finger. They're actually laying down tracks. They're, put, they're basically putting little molecular breadcrumbs along the path. And so when you damage, typically when you damage one of those axons, the entire axon dies and sometimes all the, the distal, the further along cells will die off as well. But because those breadcrumbs are there, mm -hmm. we can potentially, and it's been shown in a few experiments, we can potentially send a new set of cells down that path following the breadcrumbs to rebuild the thing. Um, Molly, uh, Molly Shoykit, a friend of mine at University of Toronto, uh, gosh, almost 20 odd years ago, 
showed me this really neat slide or, or video where she was working with these, um, these neural cuffs. And these, it's basically this nerve conducting gel that you can put in. And so she puts these into the spinal cord of rats that have had a, a, a transection. So they've had part, part of their spinal cord has been cut intentionally. So they're, per, they're partially paralyzed. We thank them for giving their lives for science. Thank you, rat. But they're not done. Then you put the, the, the cuff into their, into their spinal space. And now you get to you wait a while. And the control rats, the ones that haven't been treated at all, they're sad little rats dragging themselves along with their four limbs, trying to make their, their life. Their hind limbs are completely inert. The treated rats, they're not walking by any means. I'm not gonna, I don't wanna you know, confuse things. But you can see them trying to move, they are moving their hind limbs in a semi-coordinated way. They can't wait there, but they are moving them. So think about how many paralytic patients right now would be thrilled with getting that level of restoration. So it's super exciting. There's the, 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 the space of neural regeneration is just blowing wide open. And it's, it's really gonna be fascinating to see where it goes. Yeah, that's extremely cool. Cause I was I was looking more into like limb regeneration and things like that, and that's not looking super practical in the meantime. Just for the sheer scale of it, like how big is a human arm? Shockingly large if you think about it. And so if we're going off of our friend the gimpy salamander, <laughs> then and about how long it takes them to regrow arms as sort of a percentage of their body weight and percentage of their lifespan. If you're going to grow an, regrow an entire human arm, we're talking like two years, which is an incredibly long time to be immunosuppressed, to be on whatever weird drugs we've got to like pump into your arm to get it to do that. So I think that's not on the table anytime soon, but something like nerve regeneration is a much smaller task. You're not trying to regrow a huge bulky thing. You're just trying to reconnect one synapse. And also things like digit regrowth, you know, regrowing fingers or hands is probably a lot more plausible in terms of size and how long it would physically take you to do it. And you got a question out here. You said that regrowing an entire arm in situ is probably un, um, not practical. What about the other thing that you sometimes see in sci-fi where the... Okay, you said... You said regrowing the entire arm is probably not practical in situ. What about if you regrow the arm in a vat yeah, and so then just regenerate where you attach it there? I think that's a lot more practical. If you can grow this stuff in a tank, then you can do it under a lot more controlled conditions. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about, oh no, I got a like tiny scratch on my like immunocompromised regrowing limb and now I've got an opportunistic infection. Say there's a, you can do a lot more controlled things, you can do a lot more drugs, not worry how they're gonna affect the rest of the person. So I think that's the way to go for something as big as a whole limb. And the real concept to kind of keep in mind is the human body or just bodies in general know how to regenerate. They can't regenerate everything, but everybody in this room is currently regenerating their skin, for example. Mm -hmm. Their blood is being regenerated. Their liver is being regenerated. And just to kind of give you an idea of how amazing livers are, to detect liver damage, 80% of that sucker has to be dead. That's just to detect it. Oh, we got a hand up back there. I do have a question. So what would it take to say extend the length of like a telomere or something of that nature to actually Oh, that's enhance. definitely how you get cancer. Right. <laughs> um, so for those of you playing along at home, telomeres are the caps on the end of your chromosomes. Um, and basically they exist because the enzyme that duplicates your DNA has to have a landing pad to start from. It can't just hang off the end and start going. Uh, so they do get shorter basically every time your chromosomes duplicate. So one of the major theories of aging is that once you lose the telomeres, the cell can no longer divide. So, hey, what if we used an enzyme to regrow your telomeres? Under like controlled conditions, like a little bit of that might be useful, 
but what you really, really, really don't want is a cell that can divide indefinitely forever. That is called cancer, and we have lots of drugs and have a very hard time fighting it. So there's a really very cautious approach you have to take if you're going to mess with telomeres. And also, aging is a lot more, like telomere science got a bunch of press a while back. But aging is a lot more than just telomeres. Right, you've got just accumulation of micro damage throughout the body. You've got accumulation of these things called advanced glycation end products, which are basically sugar residues that stick onto cells and proteins and, and make them all manky and don't work as well. There's, there's a lot of different things that happen in the aging process, and it all piles up. So if you just solve the telomere problem, great. You gave them cancer. You didn't actually extend their life. And kind of to add to this, think about it. What is the area that is most likely to develop cancers or some other issue throughout life? It's the skin. Why? Because the skin regenerates more than any other part of the body, save the liver. So, and so the more it makes copies of itself, the more chance there is something to go wrong. It's also exposed the most to the things you're encountering mm -hmm. yeah. out in the world, the most chemicals, UV, all that kind of stuff. Your skin is having to deal with all of that. There's, um, there's, there's some interesting examples of that in the animal kingdom. In that, I mean, we've already talked about starfish and, and uh, salamanders and, and axolotls, but you know, even the, in mammals, some mammals are really good at healing. Those mammals are also very prone to cancers. Um, it, you know, Deadpool is in some ways not an exaggeration. Like, it's going to suck if you have that regenerative capacity, if it's not very carefully targeted. Hi. Um, so I was a zoology major in college, so I'm a lot more interested in organismal biology rather than, like, cellular. But um, one of the things that you said about how the axon can regrow itself, um, and same with the, the dendrites and stuff, how exactly does it reform connections, especially when you've reached an age where your neurons stop regenerating as frequently? Um, that just, I, I would be curious to hear a more in-depth explanation about that. There, uh, to be very honest, there isn't a good explanation. Um, the axon regrowth is painfully slow, and that makes it very hard to actually study. I'd say literally painfully? Yes. <laughs> well, it depends on which nerve it is. I, I, in college, I suffered a, an injury that, that um, basically, I, and you can see the scarring, I, have, I suffered s s uh, deep cuts right around my eye. And that actually severed one of the nerves that comes out of your eye socket and, and innervates your, uh, your scalp. So for decades, I had this dead space of skin on my scalp. But it hurt like the dickens, despite the fact that it had no sensory and you know, along that line is you also run into the whole phantom pain concept mm -hmm. of there is nothing there but the brain interprets the missing signals as pain and theoretically one of the things that you could think about too is if you've ever had a limb go to sleep and when it's waking up the blood flow going back into it potentially long term uh nerve repair would feel like that. Ow. I know, right? <laughs> Ow. There, th that reminds me of something called um, ischemia reperfusion injury, which is mm -hmm. when uh, it particularly happens in the bowel in certain situations, but it can happen else elsewhere where if blood flow is a cut off for an extended period of time, we're talking longer than yeah. your leg falling asleep, but for hours, say, there are certain biological processes that get kicked off in response to that hypoxia, that low level of oxygen. Well, if you then suddenly get a fresh flood of blood into the site, you're also getting a fresh flood of immune system. And then immune system sees all these signals that are saying, the cells are saying, help me, help me, help me. And so the immune system goes and tries to help, but it helps by ripping the place to shreds. So the, these ischemia reperfusion injuries are a wonderful example of like, tried to help, really <laughs> screwed it up. Mm -hmm. I, so I'm, I'm getting the sense from you guys that you know, regrowing my arm in a tank is the way to go. <laughs> Boy, that's a lot of structure. I know. That's the thing. Like, 3D structures are complicated. Yeah. Um, mm. That's something that they're working on with cells in culture because you can actually take stem cells, treat them with the right cocktail, and turn them into beating cardiac. They will sit there 
form little heart muscle cells and beat in a petri dish and put off electrical signals, it's incredibly cool. Mm -hmm. Trying to get them to actually form the 3D structure of a heart mm. is a lot harder. So I think there's a lot of work in sort of making scaffolds out of biomaterials that you can yeah. get them to grow on to try to get that to happen. You went, ooh, ooh. Did, did you read the paper of the decellularized hearts being repopulated? I didn't read the paper, but I saw like a headline about it. What do you so do you so? The idea was so remember we talked about axons. You know they lay down the, the breadcrumbs and everything. So in this study they took I want to say rabbit hearts maybe I forget um, and completely decellularized them basically through a series of processes you can wash out kill off and wash out all the cells but leave the rest of the structure intact. So this is sort of like taking all the drywall and stuff out of your house and you just got the yeah you just, yeah yeah that's a good, ex good love good that analogy. analogy yeah that's that's excellent I'm stealing that okay um, no. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, so you've just got this framework, this scaffold of a heart, and then they inject it with new uh, myocardial cells, the, the principal mus muscle cells of the heart. And they took up resonance, and a little while later, the little heart in the dish starts going It was really cool. So how far away do you think we are from using that technology to then transplant those formerly decellularized structures into humans? Well, I'm going to go back in time a little bit and kind of give an explanation. So there is a condition out there called transposition of the great arteries. Okay? In this condition, uh, during the embryonic development, the heart doesn't twist enough or it twists too much, and the pulmonary trunk and the aorta are reversed. That sounds bad. Well, <laughs> for, for those of you that don't know basic heart function, the heart is two pumps in series. So you have blood coming in on the right side of the heart, goes down, goes out to the lungs, that's pump number one. Then it comes back on the left side of the heart, goes out and goes out to the body, and then comes back around to the right. In, transpos in transposed hearts, it's two pumps in parallel. So you got one that just cycles back to the lungs and one that cycles to the body. Ouch. So yeah, it's not very conducive to life. Back in the early 60s and into the 70s, a doctor named Mustard and another doctor named Sane came up with a method of rewiring the heart. Now, the modern fix is they literally cut off the aorta in the trunk and put them back where they're supposed to be and everything's fine, everybody's good. But in the 60s and 70s, they couldn't do that. They just figured out balloon septostomies and knocking out atrial walls and things like that. What they did is they redirected blood flow by building an artificial battle system within the heart using a scaffolding. Okay? And so the blood comes in on the right, gets shunted over to the left ventricle, comes in on the left, gets shunted over to the right ventricle. This does turn the right ventricle systemic, which can cause a series of problems in and of itself. But the amazing part is, over time, that scaffolding becomes the heart. Okay, so the, the myocytes do sort of move in and take up residence. Yep. Okay. Cool. And it, uh, the heart literally reshapes itself. Uh, and then of course you also get uh, hypertrophied right ventricle and atrophied left ventricle and all kinds of fun stuff with that. But, yeah. but this is stuff that was done 50 years ago. So the answer is the scaffolding technology has kind of been there mm -hmm. for a while. It's the how to make it take the shape and really deal with the myocytes, because this is more epithelial and endothelial types. Uh, but it's there. So the answer is soon. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's also a, a, you know, a question of use case. like. Mm -hmm. Heart transplants exist, and they work. Mm -hmm. um, so how often is somebody going to benefit from something really radical and crazy like this? That's what drives the investment. That's what drives the number of labs working on it. Uh, so in this case, I think it's also a matter of it being a little bit niche. Mm. Yeah. Well, it also goes into the whole immune system equation, too. So when you take the whole immune system short version, it's really good at identifying self from non-self. Mm -hmm. And if it's non-self, it blows it up. 
And if there happens to be self in the way, it blows it up too. Okay? And so with transplants, you are taking something from somebody else and putting it in a non-self organism and there's arguments. And so usually you get heavy doses of immunosuppressants to basically wait out the immune system until it says, okay, I guess you can stay. So in that case, the scaffolding would actually be superior because you could potentially right. take cells from the person, grow the whole thing from their own cells, then you don't have to worry about rejection when you put it back in. Or at least not as much. Yeah, one of the, we worked a bit, bunch on that and on um, both generating tissue engineered uh, uh, blood vessels for uh, bypass surgery, as well as bone and cartilage. And one of the biggest problems we faced there was, yeah, the, the idea of an autologous so taking your cells, growing them, and putting them into the scaffold and making your, is the time, right? If you need a coronary bypass surgery, you need it now. You mm -hmm. can't wait three months for me to go to the lab and grow up you a new blood vessel. So <laughs> it was one of the big challenges we faced. So, so what you're saying is basically we need to move to the principle of the island where we just pre-grow all the organs that you could potentially need throughout life. That's exactly what yeah, I was yeah, thinking. Yeah. A whole bunch of headless clones. Yeah. Love it. Uh, Liz, I see we have a question over here. Oh. Okay. Uh, hi there. Um, I was wondering, so you, we're talking about the uh, part, the ends of the DNA, I can't remember what you called them. The telomeres? The telomeres. Um, you said that they eventually, you know, they just cannot produce anymore. Um, so what is it about cancer that just allows it to keep on going and going and going and going? Ah, uh, yeah, so, yes, how does it become the Energizer Bunny? Um, so there actually is an enzyme called telomerase. Uh, people who name enzymes are not very creative. We take <laughs> what it does and we slap an ace on the end. Yep. Um, and telomerase actually lengthens telomeres. Um, most normal adult terminally differentiated cells that have graduated from cell college turn it off uh, and can't use it anymore. But cancer cells um, usually turn it back on because it's to their advantage to be mm -hmm. able to do that. Um, and this is just an evolutionary thing. The cancer cells that don't manage to do that don't make it. The ones that do manage to do it through random chance, those are the ones that keep going. So curious about any sort of regeneration that maybe is nonspecific and if you've seen anything uh, that, would, that could cause acceleration. So you get a cut or something that might be severe but not an arm chopped off, is there a potential application to be able to administer some, so, some sort of a drug that could boost regeneration in the short term to assist in healing? Actually, that's a major concept in surgery just in general. Um, and the two major principles right now that we're working on for speed of healing, uh, is one, making sure there's a scaffolding. So a lot of times in burn patients or people that have to have large amounts of skin removed, they will put a scaffold in, an artificial scaffold for it to grow on because that speeds up the process. It takes that step away. The other one is minimize the distance. And so the largest feature of surgery is learning how to close the wounds so that everything is as close together as possible so that it can heal fast. And then the third factor is, of course, make sure that the immune system doesn't have to go and destroy things. So keep it clean, keep it healthy. That right now is where we are, right? Where we'd like to be is a way to control the immune system so that it focuses on healing and less on the nuclear option. Yeah, we can say, we've got this, we understand sterile now, we have antibiotics, you can, you can calm down that side of things. And if you achieve that, you'll probably win a new Nobel Prize. Yep. Yeah. Um, there are a couple of tissue engineered uh, products that are available on market, um, primarily in skin. Uh, there's, there are at least two different tissue engineered skins I'm aware of. Uh, one of them is grown from human, uh, discarded human foreskins uh, from a single foreskin, you can grow approximately three football fields worth of human skin. Um, because they are neonatal cells, they're, they're from a newborn child, um, they are highly undifferentiated, in fact, even immunogenically, they, so they don't tend to trigger the immune system and get, you don't get those rejection problems. 
also because the skin is what's called an immunoprivileged site that basically yeah. the immune system has a tendency to just say, yeah, that's skin, that's up there, we don't, whatever. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's, there, there are tissue engineered skins. Biggest problem is the cost issue. Mm. They're really expensive. Whereas we can get, you know, I can take skin from here and put it on here, or I can take it off of a cadaver and put it on you. Yeah. Uh, so talking about the, the distance problem, I've seen a really cool thing that they do for burn grafts now is they'll take, you know, a piece of skin from here, but then they basically make it like a chain link fence. Yeah. They put all of these little alternating holes in it so then you can stretch it out and it covers way more surface area and it just has these small little gaps it's got to fill in rather than trying to start from a big square and grow out uh, to fill in the edges. So that's been very successful in helping people patch up with skin grafts much, much faster. And that, the, the thing that does that is literally a modified pasta cutter. Yeah. Yep. It's like you've seen people I'm, like Mario Batali cranking out pasta yeah. on TV. That's what it is. It's yeah. actually, it's funny. So it's called a mesher, and the, my former employer sold the most popular mesher in the entire world. <laughs> You'd be amazed how many kitchen gadgets end up in science labs. Oh, yeah. oh my God, yeah. French presses, blenders. Power drills. Power drills. Cordless was, was the greatest invention ever for orthopedic surgery. And brushless motors. Yes. Wow. So, um, on the on the topic, I mean, there was a article that hit the news earlier this summer. They had taken a, a pig heart and done that cell wash yep. that you described, and basically infused it with human. Basically, took the pig structure, turned it into a human heart. Um, it was a the the patient was brain dead. It was yep. that they had donated the body to science, and so they were able to implant. They were able to transplant the heart into yep. into that and it you know survived until they you know, yeah they it was very cool science it's still a long way from doing it in a patient one of the big problems is that that's going to be an fda regulated process most likely uh, fda has made major strides over the last decade to take over regulation of a lot of these products and these even these procedures even if there's no product involved uh, so you're gonna have the government up your shorts yeah, I mean, as it should be. Um, yeah. I work at a, a pharma company. We work on um, bioengineered CAR T cells for cancer therapy. And it's actually been incredibly reassuring uh, working with the FDA. They do not play around. Like, I have never seen so many like rich CEOs quake in their boots uh, as I have when they heard there was going to be a meeting with the FDA or you had to submit any documentation to them because they take their jobs very seriously, and they will be all over you if they have any questions about the data. So quite frankly, after working at this company, I feel a lot better about what's in my medicine cabinet. <laughs> I was just curious. Um, I've been doing uh, reading cells at work and such, but I don't know how much is truth versus fiction. So I know that certain cells reproduce, maybe like semen and such, but certain other cells don't, like for say um, kidneys and such. So why is it that some do and some don't? and then like they die off and then you get incontinence and all this other stuff. I feel like that's the million dollar question. Yeah. And I honestly don't think like we've got a good handle on it. I, mean, I, can, I can say in certain tissues like tendon, ligament, cartilage, um, they are avascular tissues so there's no blood vessel supply and there's no lymphatic immune supply. Um, so there's just nothing there for the cells to work with. They're barely able to get enough energy to keep stay alive. Mm. much less regenerate and so some of those tissues are just foregone conclusion if you get if you develop osteoarthritis I'm really sorry look for a good surgeon um, yeah there's some know, that other, um, like yeah. kidney and those well, there's some that like just jettison their nucleus entirely once they're they finish what they're gonna do red blood cells don't yeah. have nuclei anymore or like I was mentioning earlier mm. muscle yeah. cells form these big multinucleated giant structures that can't divide anymore it Speaking from the, the kind of medical side, uh, it's playing the odds in a lot of things of how likely is this area to get damaged under normal circumstances. And if the answer is it is, then chances are it's got an ability to regenerate. Uh, like when you're dealing with tendons and ligaments, so they're made out of connective tissue, the default material when it can't replace it by regeneration is it just throws in connective tissue so 
what happens when you cut a tendon but you're able to get it close enough it throws down scar tissue which is just connective tissue and it'll replace it when you do it with muscle you start running into problems because the muscle isn't made out of scar tissue it's made out of muscle and uh, but on the grand scheme of things before we started messing with things um, muscles were not as likely to get damaged as uh, tendons and ligaments because they've got certain safeguards in it the nerves are deep so they've got safeguards the blood and lymphatic it is intended to be disposable so yeah it you know gets destroyed in the spleen and other places sent out the body and then your bone marrow makes new ones yeah it makes a lot of sense actually you know yeah. from a like historical perspective you're much more likely to twist your ankle and survive than you are to get you know a chunk taken out of your calf muscle and survive yeah. so yeah that's the way the body prioritized yeah. healing things and you go back to the liver why is the liver the amazing regenerator because it's exposed to every single poison that you ever get yeah if you ever want to do a cleanse that's called your liver and your kidneys <laughs> yeah and so yeah the, the liver has an amazing ability to regenerate because it's more likely to be exposed to these things all right Same this guy's had his skin. hand up forever yeah yes yep. okay so you've decellularized the heart you have your protein matrix how best do you proceed from there in trying to get the tissue to grow appropriately do you have any recommendations for particular growth media or doping the material <laughs> That's technically over my head. Uh, see, this is good science when you say, I don't know. <laughs> the, 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 there is a cop-out answer, which is as close to what it's going to be in when it's implanted is what you want it to be in. That is extremely cool. We should be hey. friends. The, the, the nutrient that, I mean, I, I, I made a note actually. Um, so like metformin um, improves wound healing in certain cr chronic wound patients, hmm. but it, and it inhibits tumor growth. So you say, yay, okay, that's a nice balance. Mm -hmm. uh, a particular growth factor called PDGF, platelet derived growth factor. Yeah, I got it right. Um, it also improves wound healing but it increases the rate of tumor growth. Hmm. So, you know, what nutrient bath are you going to use? What culture medium? There are good, gr I wouldn't even want to start trying to count the number of combinations you could possibly come up with. And some of them are gonna look great for a while and then go to pot. And some are gonna be terrible to begin with. And gosh, it's, a, it's quite the challenge. Uh, as far as muscles go, I'd never heard what you guys have been talking about there, my understanding is that as you work out, you're breaking the muscle down and it gets kind of its own lactic acid bath. Uh, could you go further into how muscles do grow? Okay. So what you have is you have your muscle cell and it's wrapped in connective tissue. Then you take a bunch of muscle cells, put them together and wrap them in connective tissue. Then you take a bunch of those and wrap them in connective tissue and that's your muscle, okay? What actually happens to muscles is the cells themselves get bigger. And so when you're talking about the tearing, it's the tearing of those connective tissue linings. Yeah, so your muscle cells aren't dividing when your quads are getting bigger. Um, they are enlarging. All the individual cells are getting bigger rather than you getting more of them, which is Kind of counterintuitive. That's not how we usually think about it working, but that's, that's what's going on. They're all just plumping up. Okay, so ignoring the conservation and um, real world effects of this, what do you guys think? Is this about the Hulk? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. Um, I'm asking, so um, I work at the aquarium, so I'm like really, really interested in conservation and stuff. Um, they've recently been doing a lot of uh, research about how to bring back certain extinct animals in terms of like uh, moving them to fill niches and ecosystems that aren't there anymore. 
Um, the one that I recently just read about was with the Tasmanian tiger because the only marsupial carnivorous marsupial left is the Tasmanian devil. So they're trying to like figure that out. However, <laughs> they're doing the woolly mammoth. I would like to know, because the Tasmanian tiger to me sounds a little bit more like variable because they're actually using DNA that they already have. But for the woolly mammoth, like, can you talk a little bit about like what that would actually entail? Because they're dumping so much money into that project. So before I go on like a half hour rant on that subject, <laughs> first I just want to, that's no, okay. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, we've, uh, I've already talked to Steven, we were joking around on the, on the back channel, and we already talked about the idea of next year bumping this up to a, a um, re, uh, from regeneration to a... Re, re, Repopulation? Re, well, no, uh, uh, why am I blanking on the word all of a sudden? Necromancy? Basically, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So next year, expect us back, but talking about bringing back the dead. Uh, but did you want to... <laughs> I could scream for hours, but. Oh, yeah. So, personally, on a personal level, I grew up watching Jurassic Park. This is wildly cool. I would love to have woolly mammoths back and passenger pigeons and all this kind of stuff. Ecologically, it is a terrible idea, but the little 12 year old in me doesn't mm -hmm. care. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's been done already. Um, so, there is a wolf species out there. Uh, that is the red wolf. Uh, it is native to uh, eastern parts of the United States, except red wolves don't actually exist. What they did is they inbred a bunch of dogs that had a little bit of red wolf in them until they got something relatively close to red wolves and then reintroduced them into the area. Um, that was kind of their first attempt. The real issue that you start running into with these is what are they going to eat yes. and the the classic example of this is the cane toads oh man <laughs> so yeah i did study abroad know. in australia i did too we had many cane toads so so here's here's what happened people moved to australia and said hey this is a wonderful place to grow sugar cane so they brought in sugar cane and of course they didn't check it and they brought in the cane beetle, which is very destructive to sugar cane crops. They then said, well, what kills the cane beetle? Oh, no. The cane toad. So they went and brought in the cane toad. Now the cane toad got to Australia and said, there's much more tastier things than cane beetles. And so it began eating all of the wonderful native bugs to Australia. Oh my goodness. Now, that wouldn't be a problem because you always hear about, well, Australia's got tons of great snakes to take care of these kinds of problems. Cane toads, when they get stressed, put a toxin on the surface of their skin. So here's the war of attrition. How fast does a snake reproduce versus how fast does a frog reproduce? Although, I mean, to sort of get back to the, all right, in fantasy land where we yeah. don't have to care Okay. about the horrible ecological disaster. Um, I think the real challenge there is finding an appropriate mother animal to carry the embryo. For instance, you're not gonna get a woolly mammoth out of a, like a small animal cannot carry a woolly mammoth embryo. You're gonna have to get an elephant. So you're gonna need something approximately the same size, probably close in species-ish. Um, and there might be some mother-child immune system fighting if they're significantly genetically different. So that's something you might have to watch out for. Um, but yeah, I think that sort of from a biological standpoint, it's looking plausible. Um, and it does make a little more sense if you're thinking about bringing back things that are recently extinct. Hmm. Um, so the ecological niche is still there or the ecology has clearly been damaged by losing it. Um, and you can see that just even from like reintroducing wolves into areas where they have been gone for a long time. It's been doing really interesting things. So I don't think it's, I think it's practical. I think it's doable in some specific cases. Yeah, and I, I'd agree with everything that's been said. Um, to take the, the ecological arg uh, argument to kind of an extreme point that can really underline it, I'd encourage you to go, um, it's a recent book by Riley Black called the last days of the dinosaurs. And in it, uh, Riley writes this beautiful 
basically prose narrative of, uh, you know, it, it reads almost more like a novel, but it's so, e and each chapter is like two days before the, the Chichaluba impactor hits, and one day before, and one day after, and then progressively, and it's from the, each chapter is from the individual of a, or from the perspective of an individual animal, hmm. and you know, what's going on in their life, so, but the, one of the really neat things that Riley brings up in that book is the idea of what was, and again, this is taking the ecology part to an extreme, mm -hmm. but what was the ecology of the dinosaurs? There was no grass. They, flowering plants had just started to evolve. So dinosaurs shaped their world, and their world shaped the dinosaurs. You couldn't bring dinosaurs back today without radically altering the planet. So there's this all oh, this it's a super complex problem. Um, and you know, yeah, you could you could talk about like thylacine and mm -hmm. But they're okay, trying they're to turn about. chickens back into velociraptors. <laughs> well, <laughs> can we get Trevor in here because Trevor would love No, actually Trevor would kill someone. Yeah. So so, so, so this so is I, a fun genetic thing. Um, chickens, you know, birds are descended from dinosaurs. There mm -hmm. are still some genes in there from dinosaurs. Chickens when they're embryonic have teeth they just disappear during development. So can you get them to persist and then you have chickens with teeth? teeth Somebody's teeth, working teeth, on it. Teeth, teeth, teeth. <laughs> Pred predatory chickens, here we go. So, the Last Days of the Dinosaurs by Riley Black, R-I-L-E-Y. And Riley is a wonderful person as well. Hi, how are y'all doing? Good, how are you? I'm doing wonderful. So um, my main interest is kind of just the understanding of longevity. And I know that as we grow and develop and or get older, essentially, that uh, regeneration slows down, correct? Yeah. In theory, I guess. Um, is there anything at the individual level that can be done to continue the same level of regeneration throughout later years in life? Or in such a way that if you can keep, like, let's say at, I don't know, Right now, at the age of 20, your regeneration is at a peak level. And as you get older, it starts to decline. Uh, would there be a way to keep that level consistent for a longer period of time? You're going to hate the answer to this. <laughs> Eat right, exercise, get eight hours of sleep, don't drink so much you nuke your liver. Uh, it's honestly the answer to most human health and longevity questions is, you know, Live clean. Uh, that helps enormously. It's also not any fun, <laughs> um, but it is by far the best thing you can do for yourself. Um, and as you get older, there's a certain amount that's just programmed in. You know, about 50% of aging is programmed. There's no way around it. About 50% is damage coming from what you've experienced in your life. So you can certainly cut down the damage half, um, and that's by being sensible and wearing your sunscreen and not, you know, trying to work some horrible shift job where you're never getting enough sleep and your circadian rhythms are always messed up. So those are the things that are under your control, fairly easy to do, don't have to get a prescription for it. On the theoretical side, theoretically, you could alter the programming. We don't know how to yet, because we're just now, I mean, even the whole telomere thing, is still somewhat of a mystery to, to, to people. But in theory, yes, you could reprogram it. And um, we have examples where things like that have actually happened. Um, the classic example I love to use is take a look at somebody in World War I versus somebody in 2020, and you will notice about a foot difference and that's been some of that's nutrition but some of that is evolution and that is evolution itself is a reprogramming of the system hi uh so a little while ago jen hardy slash dax dax um said something about policy uh and what drove research and funding and so i actually was wondering how do you incentivize research into something like a heart replacement that is grown based on a you know, patient's own cells, requires all this research. How do you incentivize that 
when there's, uh, there are drug companies and companies out there that stand to profit from things like immunosuppressants and selling them. So, I mean, it's like, how do you, it's like, how do you have them fund you to make a car that doesn't need new tires ever? You know what I mean? Yeah. Essentially. All right. So, um, spoiler alert, there, we've got a panel on Sunday, um, A Drug's Life, which will be talking a lot about this process. Um, so, if you want more info, I would show up to that. Um, but the short answer is that people are looking at every avenue all the time. There's this kind of, this is a notion that I keep running into people being like, oh, pharmaceutical industries aren't interested in cures because that doesn't make them money long term. That's just not true. The problem is that these are really hard problems to solve. They will take any answer they can get. Um, so everybody's just throwing stuff at the wall trying to find anything that sticks. It just turns out it's a lot easier to come up with a treatment than a cure. Um, so that's what you see most of the time. But I would say people are not hugely disincentivized from finding cures. That is something people do work on. Um, for basic research, though, that's not going to be obviously profitable in the near term, that's where you get like, R&D that has to be funded by the government. That's where you get National Science Foundation grants. That's where you get stuff coming out of uh, the cancer institutes. So this is a thing that's really important, is to fund basic science. Nobody finds this stuff like CRISPR because they were looking for it. We found it because somebody funded research in a weird bacteria lab that said, huh, we see these funny tandem repeats in our bacteria, I wonder what it is. So funding basic science is how this stuff that isn't an obvious money spinner gets done. And related to CRISPR, I just have to point out, you can go online for about 170 bucks, you too can inject CRISPR into yourself. Strongly not recommended. <laughs> I am not making this up. It's true. But, oh God. What? Well, I have so many questions. <laughs> what? I think that's pretty much the question. Yeah. <laughs> Just what? Yeah. For for about uh, twelve hundred, you can get a full lab. Oh dear God. <laughs> uh, that's uh, that's one of them, but there's a couple of places. Yeah, I, so uh, this sort of feeding back into like the regeneration, you know, panel mm -hmm. idea before we wander too far off. Um, Us so, never. Yeah. So CRISPR is actually really easy to use. This is why it is super sexy. Um, basically, proteins are hard. DNA and RNA are easy. Um, they are simple molecules. They're just big, long chains, really easy to make in a giant vat. So you've got your CRISPR protein, which never has to change, and then the targeting bit is this nice, easy to synthesize molecule. It's also really easy to understand how DNA base pairs with itself. So like, I wanna target that bit. I need a bit that matches it. I can synthesize it. I can order it from IDT there in Iowa. I'll have it in a FedEx envelope tomorrow. So that is one of the tools that's really helping biologists be able to do more interesting experiments in tweaking the human genome to say, all right, what does happen? You know, if we want to change one of these pathways related to regenerating or aging, now we have the tool to selectively try individual tweaks in a way that we weren't really empowered to do before. So I think that's going to advance the science faster, being able to flip things on and off um, in a much more controlled and fast way. And that there are some really interesting issues. Uh, I, my day-to-day -day job is much more about just getting individual physicians and clinics to adopt certain technologies. And you know, getting them to say, yes, this is a better outcome for my patients isn't always the complete question because they have to deal, deal with the cost of it. And if it's more expensive but better for the patient, they may say, sorry, we can't afford it, go away. Um, and then you've got all sorts of structural issues. Um, you know, think about the average American changes their employer, I believe the last number is every 2.5 years. Mm -hmm. That means you're changing your insurance every 2.5 years. So is your insurer motivated to keep you alive for the next two and a half years? Or are they insure incentivized to keep you alive for the next 40 years? Mm -hmm. Well, most of us within 20 to 30 years are gonna be on Medicare and Medicaid. So it becomes Medicaid's problem. So all sorts of structural issues that are getting in the way of some of these these developments. Um, not it, absolutely basic science is going to that's going to put the big thing out there that Congress is going to have to say, oh crud, we got to change something because the American public is up in arms about it. Hopefully not literally. Um, <laughs> um, but 
So, so there's there's all sorts of, sorts of issues, and it's not just a, a simple matter of bringing great science into the field. Um, so it, it's it's a really complex problem that we need to work at in multiple directions. Um, I was curious if, say, for something in a um, like a cybersecurity situation where you can apply a fake ID to something, would it be possible if you could take someone's genetic ID? and apply it to a synthetic or maybe a cy cybernetic part, attach that to someone, and then try to trick the immune system in by applying a fake ID to that part that you're trying to attach to their body? Uh, they do that. Okay. So um, this is a slightly different variation. But uh, hemolytic disease is a newborn, right? They quite literally drain all of the blood that's identified as foreign and put in new blood to trick the system until the system learns to accept the blood that the newborn has developed. Yeah, so th there are ways to do it. Uh, they are also, it's quite literally one of the great battles against bacteria and viruses is them trying to beat the system of identifying self versus non-self. Um, it's all very spy versus spy. Yeah, it's, and that, that's, that is, if you've ever seen cells at work, it's actually a pretty accurate depiction of how the immune system really does work and how viruses and bacteria try to infiltrate the system and sneak around and cause all kinds of havoc and you also get um, parasites that also you know large multicellular organisms that try to trick the system if you are ever in danger of getting a good night's sleep go read up on tapeworms in your brain yeah <laughs> you'll never sleep again cutaneous visceral migraines uh, migraines is also another fun one to look up and then, of course, everybody's favorite, Dracunculus and Cygnus. Explain, please. Dracunculus and Cygnus, a.k.a. the guinea worm. Oh, God. Oh. Or, or uh, another fun one is uh, Diopthophalli uh, renali, the kidney worm. The kidney worm, so, so Dracunculus is, you know, millimeters thick, but, you know, meters long. Dracunculus gets to be uh, meters long, but it's a couple centimeters thick. It's chunky, all right. Very, yeah. And you just literally open up the kidney capsule and it's nothing but this one very large worm. Oh. <laughs> Thanks for that, man. You're welcome. <laughs> you wanna Vet <laughs> veterinary <laughs> medicine is nightmare fuel, let me tell ya. <laughs> if you. Yeah, if you wanna go look up guinea worm, uh, they, they literally will pull, pull one end of the worm out and start wrapping it on a pencil as they're pulling it out of the patient. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> We're done here. <laughs> um, so I think one of the interesting points about parasites is actually that they teach us a lot about the immune system because they're so good at evading it. Um, I see we're sort of coming to time here, so I'll try to wrap this up quickly. Um, and I think it's also something we're learning a lot from COVID is about how immune systems react. I think we're going to come out the other side of this with a lot more knowledge about how the immune system operates, how to turn the knobs and dials on the immune system. And that's something that, as, you know, as we were talking about at the beginning, is going to be pretty critical for figuring out some of these medical advances. We need to be in better control of how our immune system is reacting and to what. Um, my last question for the panel is probably a lengthy one, so ideas for next year. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us tonight at Regeneration. Please do not forget to rate us in the app. Rating us in the app is how we get more panels, more rooms, more cool stuff for next year. Uh, we have you. no more big room events tonight, but we do have one more panel in this room tonight, which is uh, Year in Science After Dark, All Sex and Drugs. Please don't forget to donate to the charity, Open Hands. If you have science questions you would like to see answered on Monday at 1 p.m. in the track in the panel of calculations you wish we weren't doing, such as how many jello shots fit in the belly of a blue whale, please <laughs> write down your questions on the index cards and put them in the box. 
Otherwise, stay safe, stay healthy, and we will see you next time. Thanks for coming.